In the previous lecture, we wrote the questions of a new theory, which is the theory of general relativity. This theory was constructed with certain theoretical requirements that were condensed in the principle of general covariance. But uh, we had to run some tests uh, to see that the theory that we have obtained uh, was uh, meaningful at all. The first uh, test that uh, one theory, new theory has to pass is that it has to contain the previous theory, uh, if that theory worked, in a certain limit. In this case, we were able to show that in the non-relativistic limit, which was uh, weak fields, and uh, in small velocities with, compared to the speed of light, one recovers Newtonian gravity. And this is the first test that the theory uh, passes. It is a meaningful theory. Uh, you at least are going to recover all the predictions of uh, Newtonian gravity, which are a lot, and uh, it works very well in the solar system. So in this sense, you have to be happy. But if, now, if you want to go further, you have to uh, find uh, new predictions of the theory that uh, depart from the old one. These predictions are contained in the form of solutions of uh, the field equations of the new theory for certain systems. In this particular case, uh, these certain systems could be well, a planet, okay, and uh, you then you want to find what is a gravitational field produced by a planet uh, according to the new field equations that you have. Well, this is uh, probably too complicated, so at the beginning you want to find something uh, a bit simpler than just a, a planet, and uh, you study idealized uh, systems, which are probably associated to planets, like uh, completely spherical or uh, rather uh, rotationally invariant uh, field configuration. Also, uh, you want to study uh, to impose uh, other simplifications, like uh, your planet doesn't move, so you look for a static uh, field configurations, and so on. The important thing is that uh, even if these uh, systems that you study are very much idealized, uh, they contain uh, always the solutions that you get contain a great deal of information. The uh, Coulomb solution is a, is a solution of the Maxwell equations for a very idealized uh, situation, which is a completely uh, spherical charge distribution, which is very, very small, so you can consider it point-like, and which is at rest at the origin or somewhere else. And uh, still, uh, what you get from, uh, that so from that solution is a lot of information about the behavior of the electric field in the case, uh, in this static case. So this is why uh, studying solutions is really, really important in any theory, and uh, people have spent a lot of time uh, trying to find exact solutions of general relativity. Okay, I just used the word exact. What do I mean by exact? So the solutions that one can get uh, in a theory are of different kinds. You can try to solve the equations uh, with uh, your computer, okay, using algorithms and uh, fixing some the values of some parameters, and then what you get are several uh, graphics or plots of data which are plotted into a graphic. You look at it and then you find uh, another graphic for a slightly uh, changed uh, parameters and so on, and this is a numerical solution, what numerical solutions look like. Often, numerical solutions is all you can uh, find because the equations are very hard to solve it in, uh, by other means. Okay, And now that uh, we have a lot of uh, computer power and programs that simplify our lives, like uh, Mathematica, people tend to, find to study numerical solutions uh, probably too much or too often. The other possibility is to uh, try to find analytical solutions. Which are solutions in which the variables or the fields of your problem are given in terms of functions and some parameters. 
uh, <coughs> they can be of two kinds. So they could be approximate. Typically, they could be uh, solutions that you find in a perturbative expansion in some small parameter, and they are good. They satisfy the equations of motion to a certain uh, level of approximation in that parameter, to a certain order in that parameter. The other possibility is that they are exact, and they just satisfy the equations of uh, motion or the field equations exactly with no approximations and to all orders in, in whatever parameters you have. It is clear that uh, analytical solutions are much better than numerical solutions. One uh, analytical solution is equivalent to many, many of these uh, plots uh, because the dependence on the parameters uh, is explicit in those equations, while in the numerical solution you have to guess uh, if uh, from one plot to another uh, the field grows or uh, decreases uh, when you change in this or that parameter. So you don't. It is much harder to find general properties of your field or of your system studying numerical solutions. As again, I'm not against them. It's just that now it is so easy to uh, to use numerical solution, and sometimes analytical uh, solutions are hard, so hard to find that automatically people tend to uh, not even try to find the analytical solution. There is also this uh, uh, proverb that says that when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Uh, well, this is uh, what happens now that uh, people have, all of us have computers, uh, probably all of us have, uh, have access to some kind of uh, program like Mathematica or similar to Mathematica, so it is so easy, it is very tempting to just put your equations there and let the computer solve it. Sometimes the computer can give you analytical solutions, so it just saves you work. But uh, when uh, it doesn't, it just gives you these uh, plots and they contain a lot less information than an analytical solution. Uh, for many years, Okay, uh, the first uh, <coughs> solution that was obtained in, in general relativity was similar to the Coulomb solution. Uh, Schwarzschild, very uh, soon after uh, the publication of the Einstein equations, uh, tackled the problem of try finding the, the gravitational field uh, around some spherical and static mass distribution in the exterior of that. In fact, he also uh, found a solution in the interior, assuming certain uh, approximations. We will study also that. This is a, a, one of these idealized uh, systems. Okay, there are no uh, completely spherical planets. Uh, nothing is uh, uh, static in the universe. However, it is a very good approximation and it is the starting point to understand a lot of properties of general relativity. The Schwarzschild solutions, the exterior, which is usually called uh, just uh, Schwarzschild solution and interior uh, Schwarzschild solution, are, uh, contain a lot of information and this is why we are going to study them. After those solutions were found, uh, a few other exact solutions were also found and also uh, for many years people uh, started invented a lot of uh, mathematical procedures to find more and more analytical solutions, exact in, in particular. This was uh, due to the fact that they are very, very interesting. It was also a challenging uh, problem because finding uh, uh, solutions, analytical solutions for general relativity is extremely difficult. Now I will uh, explain why. Uh, so people were got very interested in this. There is there was another reason that you could also argue that uh, for many years the amount of experimental data on uh, gravity was so small that uh, the best that you could do was to study formal aspects of the theory. So uh, general relativity uh, was studied for many years in a math department in the, instead of a physics department. And uh, nevertheless, the work done in, during the, those uh, dark years was uh, very, very good, and uh, we are profiting from uh, many other results obtained at the time. Although for 
many years, probably people consider that that kind of work just purely mathematical and of no direct uh, physical interest. Okay, so why are uh, so uh, solutions of general relativity uh, so hard to find? Well, the first thing is that uh, we saw that the Einstein equations are very complicated, and in particular they are non-linear because the gravitational field couples to itself, and uh, this results in non-linearities in the uh, field equations. This always makes your life more complicated. But also, there is not uh, a clear-cut uh, separation between sources and field. If you look at the right-hand side of the equations, where the energy momentum tensor is, you find the, the gravitational field there also. Uh, in particular, in the field of a perfect, uh, in the energy momentum tensor of a perfect fluid, you see that the metric is, is part of it. So it's not as simple as, okay, I have this energy momentum tensor and then I solve for the left-hand side of the uh, Einstein equations because uh, the variable is also on the right and then you don't really know 100% what this energy momentum tensor uh, is. Okay, it depends on the unknown. Okay, so it looks like it is going to be a difficult uh, task, or it may seem impossible, but as I said, there are people have developed uh, a lot of techniques uh, to find the, uh, solutions. I have uh, to warn you that uh, in many cases, uh, these techniques give you solutions uh, for physical situations that you don't know what they are. Okay, and this is uh, one problem of many of these uh, uh, mathematical techniques to, to construct solutions. And, um, well, this is uh, also, this gives me opportunity to talk about the interpretation of the solutions. I suppose that you went uh, one of these solutions. Uh, this means that you get, uh, on the one hand, your gravitational field represented by a metric, and on the other hand, you, are completely, you have completely determined the energy momentum tensor because since it depends on the metric, okay, you don't really know what it is like until you find the metric. You have found these two things. Sometimes, studying this energy momentum tensor, you can learn about uh, the system that has produced this gravitational field. In some other cases, this is so complicated that, um, well, it takes a long time to realize what is the physics of the gravitational field uh, that you just found, okay, by imposing, by using some techniques or imposing some symmetries. Even in the simplest case, which is the Schwarzschild uh, solution, people uh, scrambled for uh, 50 years to find what was the, the meaning of this uh, gravitational field. And only 50 years later, after uh, Schwarzschild found the solution, uh, it was arrived uh, to the comp uh, people arrived to the uh, concept of a black hole, and uh, to the idea that the Schwarzschild solution describes what we know, understand it is a black hole. Okay, in this uh, <coughs> lecture, we are going to use the simplest uh, mathematical techniques. Basically, we will uh, simplify our system. Uh, will be very much idealized by imposing symmetry, as, uh, as basically Schwarzschild did, as uh, you have to do to recover the Coulomb solution, and so on. Or we will impose, for instance, uh, spherical symmetry, and uh, we will also uh, study static uh, field configurations. Furthermore, uh, we will use these simplifications not just to constrain the form of the gravitational field, but also to simplify uh, the uh, coordinates and the functions that appear. Uh, the existence of uh, symmetries, as we also studied uh, in the previous lecture, is associated to the existence of killing vectors, and you know that there are adapted uh, coordinates to some of the killing vectors, which means that you will find uh, coordinates such that the metric does not depend on them. And this means uh, that, I mean, the less uh, dependence on coordinates, the simpler the, the functions that the 
uh, correspond to the components of a metric. So this will be the other simplification. So basically, we will use symmetry and uh, coordinates. Uh, and uh, coordinate choices. This will be our main tools. They are very good, at least to get um, the simplest uh, and the most important uh, solution, by the way. Uh, I have to mention a bit uh, more about uh, numerical relativity because now it is a very uh, rich field of uh, work. Probably you have heard that uh, numerical relativity has been essential in the detection of uh, gravitational waves and in the de interpretation of the gravitational waves that have been detected. I have to warn you that um, most of the uh, knowledge that we had about the gravitational waves and the gravitational wave profiles uh, that the merger of two black holes would produce uh, was known analytically, okay, by approximate methods, but analytically, and that the uh, contribution of numerical methods is really, really small. It is crucial, but it is uh, very small. And most of the profile of the wave detected has had been predicted by analytical methods uh, long before uh, they were detected, and also long before the numerical methods were uh, good enough uh, to. Uh, produce these profiles okay because the problem with uh, all these methods is that they need a, a lot of computing power that was not available before in any case uh, numerical relativity uh, is based on a different point of view that the uh, one we are going to study in this lecture and also in this uh, course uh, see that the gravitational equations that we have obtained did time as another coordinate so time is not a special coordinate. In numerical relativity, one uses uh, another formulation of general relativity, which is uh, uh, the 3 plus 1, or the, uh, uh, it's also uh, sometimes called Hamiltonian approach, or uh, initial data problem of general relativity. The idea is that uh, you choose in your space, which you still don't know what is going to be, because you only know uh, what is uh, your space after you solve the equations, you choose what is called a Cauchy surface. In this case, it is a three-dimensional hypersurface, which is space-like. In Minkowski space-time, this would be uh, a hypersurface of constant time, for instance, would be a Cauchy hypersurface. It is a hypersurface which is uh, good to set, uh, to fix the, the initial values of all your uh, fields, in particular of the gravitational field. Then uh, what you do is to use the, uh, the Einstein equations written in the adequate form uh, to evolve uh, this initial data and reconstruct the full four-dimensional space-time. In this way, uh, well, this this is a very first of all this formulation is complicated, so and we have no time to review it. But uh, let me just notice that uh, in this formulation, uh, the initial data that you can put in a three uh, <coughs> uh, space like uh, well, in a Cauchy hypersurf hypersurface uh, are not arbitrary. Uh, in um, electromagnetism you are used to the fact that uh, most of the problems that you solved in uh, high school and so on are uh, of the kind okay you put some charges and some current here and there and and then uh, you are asked to find the uh, electromagnetic field here uh, well you cannot just put anything uh, okay uh, three, your gravitation the gravitational field that you uh, put here and the matter that you put here and the fields that you put here uh, are not arbitrary. They already have to satisfy uh, a set of equations 
And these equations already contain a lot of information. They are uh, non-trivial. For instance, suppose that you want to describe the merger of two black holes. You would like to set initial data that describe a black hole at a given time here and another one at a given time here. However, uh, well, it may not be possible to have these two black holes, uh, for instance, at uh, zero speed, uh, you know, at <coughs> you have the positions of the black holes, you have uh, the, the initial uh, velocities, and so on. But sometimes these things, uh, these, these things are not uh, physically possible mm, to realize. So not all the initial data that you can conceive are good. And there are certain equations uh, that constrain the possible initial data. By solving this uh, constrained initial data, you already have uh, quite a lot of information about the system. The evolution has to be done numerically. Uh, this is uh, why numerical relativity is mm, almost uh, always associated to this uh, formulation. It's called 3 plus 1 because you have to split your space-time in uh, uh, three-dimensional hypersurfaces uh, which evolve in the uh, time uh, direction. We are not going to say uh, much more about this, but uh, you have to know that it exists, that it is very important, that it is not always better than an uh, analytic uh, method, but that it gives you a very important input also. Let's see how we can use symmetry to simplify the Einstein equations and then make it easier to find solutions to them. The Einstein equations are a set of differential equations in 10 variables. These 10 variables are the 10 independent components of the metric, which is a 4 by 4 symmetric matrix. If, uh, if we can reduce the number of independent components, the independent variables of these uh, equations, clearly the equations will be simplified. Now, one way of simplifying, of uh, reducing the number of independent variables will be to assume that there are transformations that relate these uh, variables and which leave the equations invariant. Now, clearly, the kind of transformations that act on the components of the metric and leave the Einstein equations always invariant are general coordinate transformations. We already know that uh, we have all these symmetries under our disposal and we will be able to simplify some, to some extent the equations by uh, performing general coordinate transformations that set the metric in a particular form. But this is uh, still uh, a bit uh, difficult and there is something a bit better. We could assume that uh, some of these general coordinate transformations leave the metric invariant. Okay, this is assuming that the metric has a certain uh, symmetry. Symmetries of the metric will correspond to symmetries of the system in general. Oh, if you suppose that uh, your system is spherically symmetric, you expect the gravitational field to be spherically symmetric. If nothing in your uh, system depends on time, then your metric will not change with time, in principle. So there is a relation between the symmetry that you assume in your system and the symmetry of of the metric. So this particular subset of general co uh, tra coordinate transformations that uh, leave invariant the metric is, as you know, uh, what we call isometries. And as we saw in the previous lecture, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between isometries and killing vectors. Okay. Just like this, killing vectors. mu, which are vectors that satisfy this equation. And this equation, which is the killing equation, is an equation which involves the vectors and the metric. So if I assume the existence of a certain uh, vector, then I am imposing conditions on the metric. If I know the metric, this would uh, be an equation that uh, help us or can be used to find the killing vectors. But we want to use it in the other way. We are going to assume that there are certain killing vectors and this uh, equation will be an equation that relates the components of the metric in a certain way. And this will tell us that some of them depend on the others, some of them are zero, or whatever, and then we will get a simplification of the Einstein equations. Remember that the killing vectors 
apart from satisfying uh, this equation, are uh, generators of the isometries in this way. Uh, here are the infinitesimal generators. So each of them generates, uh, corresponds to an infinitesimal tra coordinate transformation of this form that leaves the metric invariant. So it is an isometry. Okay, so the idea is that we will ask the metric, uh, we will impose that the metric will have uh, a number of Killing vectors of a certain form that corresponds to the symmetries that we assume for our system. The second tool that we will use to simplify the Einstein equations will be to make a special coordinate choices. This is related also to uh, the idea that you can perform general coordinate transformations that transform some coordinates into some other coordinates which are bring the equations in a simpler form. When you have uh, symmetries or you have asymmetries uh, before there is clearly uh, a very very special uh, choice of coordinates which is to choose the coordinates adapted to the isometry. Now, there will be a, a problem when we have more than one isometry uh, because we saw that if you have two killing vectors, let's say k and l, the condition uh, uh, that has to be satisfied in order to uh, be able to choose coordinates adapted both to k and l simultaneously, so it is always possible to find a coordinate adapted to k, it is always possible to find a coordinate adapted to l, but uh, can this be done simultaneously? Well, this can be done if the Lie bracket of these two vectors vanishes. And this will not be true in general. Uh, remember that the Lie bracket uh, is this, uh, sorry, of this quantity minus L mu K mu. And this is a vector. Okay, this is always a vector, and uh, what we are demanding is that this vector <coughs> vanishes. Sometimes we say that K and L commute. So this is what we will uh, assume that, uh, well, we will uh, uh, assume that there are geometries that will try to find coordinates adapted to the largest number of them, which is uh, possible. And uh, we will find, uh, simplify the form of the Einstein equations that we will try to solve. Then the question now, that uh, this is our plan, so what kind of symmetries should we demand? Well, the symmetries uh, depend on the physical situation that we want to represent. The simplest situation that uh, we can uh, conceive is that of uh, a static situation, and the static <coughs> mass or energy distribution, some uh, <coughs> a mass uh, distribution or energy distribution that does not change uh, with time, and uh, furthermore, which is spherically symmetric. The assumption of spherical symmetry is one of the most common uh, simplifying assumptions, but it is also one of the most uh, productive. Uh, uh, it brings you to this, uh, although people exaggerate and say, uh, talk about this spherical cow, okay, as a simplified model of a cow, it is true that uh, a spherical cow can be a good approximation to a cow to start with. Then we do start adding corrections like horns, legs, etc. But uh, it is a very good starting point, and you can learn a lot about. Uh, uh, a cow in general, uh, just assuming that it is uh, spherical and maybe with uh, constant density. Mm. Uh, for a physicist, uh, this is uh, probably good enough as a starting point. Okay. Then what we are going to do in the next video is to see how we can impose these two simplifying conditions, which are symmetry conditions, in terms of killing vectors. Mm. How we can associate uh, staticity to the existence uh, of uh, some killing vector and spherical symmetry to the existence of some other killing vector.